You know what, it's about time that ideas shared the same stage with rock stars, yeah? Okay. Well, my name is Robin Ezrock. You know when you watch a travel show, you see these shows on TV and you see some guy running around the world doing all this amazing stuff, and you think, who the hell gets that job? Well, I created and I host a TV show called Word Travels. We filmed it in 36 countries. You can see it here in Canada on OLN and City TV. And it's in 21 languages and over 100 countries on Travel Channel worldwide. I'm a travel writer. The show follows me as a travel writer. I've been the columnist for The Globe and Mail, MSN, Simpatico, The Vancouver Sun. And I'm here to talk to you about how to travel. I once asked 1,732 people from 46 countries in every conceivable background three questions about their lives. One of the questions was, finish the sentence, I regret. Now, few people said, I regret not working harder, and I regret not being more successful. One guy said, I regret not driving a nicer car. No. The most universal, common answer that I received was, I regret not traveling more. Now, travel means many things to many people, right? It's a form of escape. It could be a business opportunity, an obligation. It's a way to connect with cultures and languages. Um, hey, man, sure, it's definitely a way to bring seduction into your life. <laughs> Eight years ago, I set out on a journey that hasn't really stopped. And along the way, I've learned some truths, and it's these truths that I'd like to share with you today starting with the fact that those of us who travel for a long time, well, we either running away from something or we're looking for something. And certainly, I was looking. Like many of you, perhaps, I would stare out the window at my desk job and I would constantly daydream about the life I wasn't living, the places I wasn't seeing, the people I wasn't meeting. I had an OK job, but I really wanted to travel, you know, like I did in my early 20s when I went backpacking. But it just seemed kind of irresponsible to quit my career and go and do such a thing. I mean, society was telling me, OK, Robin, you're turning 30 years old. It's time to settle down, make some dough, and enter this godforsaken housing market. <laughs> well, my journey began around the corner literally, on Alberni Street. I was on my way to work, riding my scooter, and this car comes out of nowhere and just drives straight into my bike. I execute this spectacular swan dive over the handlebars, trash the bike, and break my kneecap. The pain was excruciating, and it is, that moment, without doubt, the best thing that's ever happened to me. We need these kind of wake-up calls to remind us that we're not getting any younger. And while the world isn't going anywhere per se, we most certainly are. That accident made me think, and it literally bought my ticket. Twelve months later, I received a $20,000 insurance settlement. Hey, it's not millions, it was just $20,000. But, you know, if I was prepared to sleep on floors and avoid expensive countries. I booked, <laughs> yeah. I booked one of the uh, best deals going in the airline racket. It's called a round-the-world ticket. And I visited 24 countries on five continents in 12 months. Now, immediately, the intensity of travel in my first few months in South America, this exposure to new people, new ideas, new cultures, began to put some things into perspective. Our lives are mitigated by routine, right? It's a routine that tells us when we wake up, when we sleep, when we eat, when we work out, when we can schedule some fun in our lives. Now, for 12 months, with all my possessions on my back, no itinerary, and a vague long-term goal about just returning to Vancouver alive, um, 
decision making began to take on a new significance. Because every morning I'd wake up and I'd think, where am I going to eat? Where am I going to sleep? And where am I going to find a clean toilet? Now, once the base of that hierarchy of needs was met, a deeper, familiar crisis began to, began to settle in. I found myself, once again, looking out that window, thinking, well, should I go to that town or this town? Should I hang out with these people or those people? I was second-guessing my decisions. I was, I was smelling that greener grass. You know, when there's so many decisions to make, sometimes it's just easier not to make any. And you feel that acutely when you travel independently, and you feel that acutely when you don't. I call it a, a decision paralysis. And then when we do make a decision, we second-guess it. You know, we, we question it. It sits in our gut like, a, like an undercooked burrito. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes I wasn't sure if I should jump on that chicken bus or over that chicken bus. I was uh, kicking myself. I was in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and I was supposed to join a friend on a, on a night bus going up north. I decided to spend a few extra days in Rio. I mean, here I am exploring like, one of the most beautiful, vibrant cities in South America, if not the world, and I just could not groove with it because all I was thinking about was that night bus and how I should have been on it because of all the amazing experiences that I'm probably missing if I were. Well, a few days later, I go up north, and I catch up with my friend, and I find him as white as a sheet. It turns out that the only thing I missed was certain tragedy. The bus that he was on had a head-on collision with a truck. He escaped with minor injuries, but six people died including the passenger seated right next to him. And from that moment, I mean, I began to realize that whatever decision I make has to be the right decision. I'm not one about to talk about religion and energy and whatnot, but it's just like you have to believe that whatever decision you make is the best decision you can possibly make. And from that moment, I realized that wherever you are is where you're supposed to be. And immediately, everything got a lot easier. Now, welcome to La Paz, Bolivia, and the rather dilapidated house of democracy. One of the legends on the Gringo Trail is to mountain bike down the world's most dangerous road. It was the first time I visited before they put in a new highway. 150 people die every year on this road as packed buses and trucks and about two dozen tourists, for that matter, have gone over the edge on this 2,000-foot cliffs, never to be seen from again. And it's pretty fun, I can tell you. It is fun riding that close to the edge. It's like as much fun as it is standing on the edge of this red carpet, wondering what's going to happen if I step over. <laughs> they told me not to step over. Um, but the, the <laughs> <laughs> so you get down to the bottom, and then uh, you realize that you actually have to get back on these same buses and trucks that go over the edge. And this time, you're not in control. And there's, no, there's no comfort there. You have to just like, close your eyes and pray to God that the driver only had five or six beers and not 12. <laughs> so I get back to the city and I take a minibus. <laughs> and because I can't speak a word of Spanish, <laughs> I get dropped off high in the hills in one of the city's worst slums. Shit. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe that travelers become victims when we look like victims. So I, I stiffened up, <clears throat> and I assume what I call my Jason Bourne, James Bond mode, right? Because those guys always look like they're in control. They always look like they know exactly where they're going. Plus, they can snap your neck in like 24 seconds, right? So uh, I start walking down this road, absolutely crapping my pants. And um, up ahead, about 30 feet up ahead, I, I notice a local walking down, and, and it gives me some comfort. Because I think, I think if I can just stick with this guy, maybe I can get out of here. You know? So I start following him. Without turning around, he notices someone is following him. I mean, we are in a slum. So he quickens his pace. I'm not going to let this guy get out of my sight. So, <laughs> you know, so I quicken my pace. And um, within, like, I don't know, a couple seconds, you have two guys running down this hill. <laughs> You know, through markets, through traffic, but always 30 feet apart. 
Now, it, it wasn't the first time I've been lost on my travels, and it certainly wasn't the first time a local has come to my aid. You know, when you read the newspapers, you would think that the moment you get off the plane, these guys are waiting for you. <laughs> If it bleeds, it leads. You know, especially when you read anything about developing countries, it just, it just, all you hear is the bad news. And it's one of the reasons why I love being a travel writer, because very often that's the only good news you'll read anywhere. Well, I've now been to 107 countries on six continents, including hotspots like Colombia, kidnapping, and Ethiopia, war, Sri Lanka, terrorism, Papua New Guinea, strange guy with a pointy stick. <laughs> you know? And I've never been, get this, I've never been robbed or attacked. I've never been, other than minor illness, I've never been physically ill or, or, or threatened. And this makes me either extremely lucky or, as I like to believe, just one of the vast majority. My experience has taught me that people will rather help you than hurt you. Locals take great pride in showing us, the traveler, their world. Whatever the culture, you wouldn't believe the lengths of hospitality that people go through. The friendliest country in the world, in my experience, Albania. Albania. You know, sure, there's places that we shouldn't go. Absolutely, absolutely. But travelers are seldom targeted. Locals might want to kill each other, but they don't go after us for anything other than petty crime. And petty crime can be dismissed with just the most basic amount of common sense. Okay, I'm not saying that people won't attack if provoked. And yes, I'm not going to tell you there aren't bad apples or deadly pieces of sushi on Granville Street. You know, there's rogue bears in them woods and there's airline seats that just don't lean back. You know, there are places to avoid and we have reasons to be cautious, sure. But if I do find myself in a situation, I have some very powerful weapons in my backpack. No, lose the guns, bring a smile. Smiling, there's something about smiling that just projects warmth and, and honesty. It's, I call it kind eyes. You see it, you see it all the time. It's, 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 it's like a softening of the soul. It's, it's why we love traveling in places like, like Africa and India, even though it can be very, very challenging. The locals that we meet, the people we meet, they, just, they disarm us with their warmth, with their friendliness, you know, with their appreciation for life's basic pleasures. I mean, it's such a contrast to when you go to a major North American city or Western European city and you feel like an intruder, like an outsider. I've smiled with uh, poof. Maori bounces in New Zealand who wanted to throw me out of bar. And I've smiled with Maasai warriors in, in Kenya. I've smiled with <laughs> men in strange hats. <laughs> That, that's the testicle festival in Montana. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've smiled in dens with man-eating saltwater crocodiles and swimming with great white sharks. And I've even smiled with kids holding armed AK-47s. I smile when I'm nervous and I laugh when I'm scared because it sure beats screaming and crying. You don't want to hear me scream and cry. Now, there's few experiences like hardcore independent travel to, to make you hear and, more importantly, listen to your instinct. How many times have you guys heard a story, some, something bad happens to someone out there, And they blame themselves because they knew beforehand to avoid that situation. They shouldn't have eaten the pink chicken. You know? They shouldn't have gotten into that taxi cab with the, with the driver slurring his words. They shouldn't have walked down that dark road in the middle of the night. And they shouldn't have believed uh, the fire doctor in Taipei when he said, Robin, this isn't going to hurt. <laughs> Uh, 
Trust your gut. The more we use our instinct, the more we, the more we hear it, the more we use it, and the more we use it, the more chance we have to avoid whatever it is that's trying to save us from. Use your gut. Trust it. Listen to it. It works so well when you're out there, and it works so well when you're here as well. Now, I've been fortunate to, to chase my passion to a degree of absurdity. I've run around the world ticking off one bucket list after another, and I believe that my success in a very challenging, very competitive industry, travel media, is due to applying these truths that I've learned out there into my daily bizarro world. And here's one of the best lessons that I learned. People you meet create the paradise you find. It's all about the people. And the paradise, literally. I'm on assignment in a uh, $2,000 a night ocean villa in the Maldives. Spectacular, yeah? And I'm having a miserable time. The whole place is kitted out for honeymooners and for romance, and I'm there by myself, dealing with a relationship disintegrating back home. Cry me your crocodile tears. <laughs> yeah. I was miserable, I was lonely, so I ended up sneaking away to the uh, staff quarters and having a beer, a couple of beers, with the cleaners. And that was fun. Paradise islands and epic festivals, wild parties, it doesn't mean much if you're not connecting and you're not sharing with the right people. Because people, the people we meet on our journey out there, on our journey in here, shape the world, shape the way we look at everything. It could be a, a Rasta priest that I met in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. This guy was living off-grid, and yet we had this wonderful debate about the merits of RFID chips. An elder in the Cook Island, he takes me into the mountains and he teaches me that anytime I'm feeling stressed, don't take, don't take a Tylenol, put yourself in nature. In Ecuador, the, sh the shaman freaks out, he, he tells me I'm cursed, and he goes into this whole ceremony, blows vodka in my face, with real concern to get rid of this curse. In Transylvania, I meet the 74-year-old farmer who teaches me how to dance with my heart and smile with my eyes. On the streets of Ethiopia, I meet street kids who believe that if they work hard enough, one day they could run in the Olympics. And you know what? Some of these guys did. And as much as I travel around the world, it's my friends who mean the world to me, and they take me to places I never thought I'd get to. These are all people that make you want to get off the couch, switch off reality TV, and start participating in reality itself. Now, I've recently returned from one more epic journey. This time, I visited every province and territory in Canada to tick off the ultimate list of things to do before you die for my first book. It's called The Great Canadian Bucket List. And once more, I've emerged at the end of this crazy journey, elated, safe, healthy, inspired by the people and the places and the creatures that I've met in this beautiful country that's way too big to call a backyard. The lessons that I've learned on my travels keep applying to the, the world that I live, the, my daily life, because I don't believe we ever stop traveling, and I don't believe we ever stop growing. And so I'm going to leave you with uh, one more piece of travel, travel wisdom. Two little words that have helped me when I really needed them, like when I jumped off the... Uh, a sky tower in Macau. This is the world's highest commercial bungee jump. Two little words that, that help me when I'm really trying not to soil my shorts. Like uh, when I'm in Chernobyl. I spent the night in Chernobyl holding a Geiger counter, hoping I'm not going to turn into a mutant. You know? They were there for me when I came face to face with death deep in, the, in, a, in an ancient burial cave in the South Pacific. They were there with me when I came out there 12 minutes ago in front of 2,000 people at the largest TEDx ever held anywhere. Two little words. So important, which is why they put, they put these words on the cover of what I think is one of the best guidebooks ever written. <gasps> Two little words that helped me when, uh, earlier this summer, my wife sent me a text message. <laughs> and uh, precipitating what I think will be the craziest adventure out of all of them. Don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so I came out here and I said, I'm going to teach you how to travel. I said, well, don't panic. Surround yourself with good people and just know that people will rather help you than hurt you. Listen to your instinct. Smile. And, uh, you know, before you go on any journey, make sure you pack the right state of mind, whether or not you're traveling or whether you're staying at home. And, okay, don't forget your toothbrush. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.